Welcome, Dr. Toll. It's a wonderful, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's so wonderful to, to meet you in person after being in touch uh, over email. Uh, we are grateful that you accepted to talk to us about a very important topic in US politics and world politics as well. I'll let Osgur Hoja actually introduce you and be the moderator. But on behalf of IRSS, thank you again for agreeing to, uh, to talk to us today. Thank you. Um, Gunnar, thank you very much uh, for uh, virtually visiting um, uh, my seminar and the IRSS tonight. Um, Gunnar is an old friend. Um, I'll just try to read her biography very shortly um, because she has a big CV actually, but this is the very short version. Um, Dr. Gunnar Toll is the founding director of the Middle East Institute's Turkey program and the senior fellow for the Frontier Europe Initiative. She is also an adjunct professor at George Washington University's Institute for Middle East Studies. She was also an adjunct professor at the College of International Security Affairs at the National Defense University. She has taught courses on Islamist movements in Western Europe, Turkey, world politics, and the Middle East. She has written extensively on Turkey-US relations, Turkish domestic politics, and foreign policy, and the Kurdish issue. She earned her PhD from Florida International University, and she earned her BA degree from the Middle East Technical University, which is our neighboring university here in Ankara. Um, Gönül, thanks a lot again. Um, would you like to start with an overview of the US elections this year? Sure. Uh, well, Özgür, thank you so much. And Eliza, thanks a lot for having me uh, in your class. It's such a such a great pleasure to be talking to you and your students today. Let me begin by saying how uh, extraordinary this election season has been. And not just because we are holding it in the middle of a pandemic, but there's also so much at stake. And uh, there are uh, plenty of polls out there uh, showing Biden is leading uh, Trump double digits, but both campaigns are still very anxious. Um, so that's an extraordinary um, uh, picture in my view. Um, elections will be held on November uh, 3rd, uh, which is a Tuesday. Um, and voters will be voting not just for president and vice president, but also one third of the Senate and all of the House of Representatives. So in, and also in many areas, state and local elections will also be on the ballot. And here is why we have to pay attention to what happens in the Senate and the House. So even if Biden defeats Trump, he will be unable to pass legislation on key issues such as healthcare, uh, immigration, and climate change unless the Democrats control the Senate. And currently, uh, the, in the Senate, Republicans have a 47 to 53 majority. So what is the, the state of, of the race uh, for, for the House? Well, House Republicans can, um, can pick up a handful of seats uh, but they probably will not be able to take back the majority from, from Democrats. And it's possible that Democrats could add to their, uh, their majority in the House. Um, they are seeing suburban uh, districts across the nation uh, become more competitive because Trump has become a liability for particularly for vulnerable uh, Republicans. But of course, in some places like uh, Virginia and, and South Florida, there are uh, vulnerable Demo Democrats who, who might lose because they had won in conservative districts the last time. And there are around 10 um, competitive House seats uh, that are most likely to flip, uh, flip parties. So what about the Senate? There are uh, 33 seats of the Senate being contested in, in regular uh, elections. And there will also be uh, two special elections, one in, in Arizona to fill the vacancy created by the death of, of John McCain in 2019. And there's one in Georgia uh, following the resignation of Johnny uh, Isaacson at the at the end of uh, last year, so in total there are 35 seats um, up for re-election in the Senate. So that means Republicans will be defending um, 23 seats in in 2020, 
while the Democrats will be defending 12 seats. So Democrats, given, given the majority, Democrats will have to, will need to pick up uh, three or four seats to gain a majority. And, and of course, that also depends on how many seats they will need, will depend on which party wins control of, of the vice presidency. So it will probably come down to seven key races across the country. Um, so the question is, can, uh, can the Democrats pull it off? Um, they might. Uh, Democratic challengers in two states, um, uh, uh, Arizona and, and Colorado, they seem to have a good chance in defeating Republican incumb incumbents, while in other places, only one Democratic incumbent in, in Alabama looks um, especially vulnerable. Uh, so the Democrats' top targets are uh, these three states, uh, Maine, uh, North Carolina, and Iowa. And in all the, uh, the three races, uh, the incumbent Republicans are in a very tricky, tricky situation uh, because of the unpopularity of, of President Trump. And the Democratic opponents could, um, could capitalize on high voter turnout, who uh, the, the high turnout among the voters who want to see Trump defeated. Um, and another troubling sign for Republicans is, um, is the, the broader demographic trends. Um, the first one is Trump is losing among women. Fewer and fewer women are saying that they will support Trump in, in 2020. Uh, suburb, suburban voters are also abandoning Trump. And he's even losing among whites without a, a college degree, which has formed an important component of, of his base in 2016. But of course, um, with, uh, with the campaign still ongoing, there is still time for these races to change, right? Because I mean, last minute, uh, we're gonna have another presidential debate between uh, Trump and, and, and Biden tonight. Um, a last minute political fallout from the debate could impact uh, could impact the race or the, the pandemic, uh, the economy, or some unforeseen twist could change the races yet again at the last minute. Um, of course, Republicans are hoping uh, that the political fight over the Supreme Court nominee, uh, who is uh, Amy Barrett, um, will galvanize conservative voters. So that's the, that's, that's the hope of, of the Republicans. And they might have a point there because it has worked before. In 2018, uh, the fight over Justice Kavanaugh mobilized conservative voters in, in midterm uh, elections in 2018. Uh, so they're hoping a similar scenario is gonna play out this year. But I think ultimately um, this year's congressional elections are a referendum on, on, on President Trump. And this is a dynamic that we have not seen before in the sense that usually voters, they have different considerations in mind when, they're, when they vote for, for the Congress. And I think the fact that everything is now focused on, on the character of President Trump is a, is a testament to how polarized American society has become in the last few years. Um, and if you look at the, the Democratic front, the polls uh, are once again delivering encouraging news to, 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 to Democrats because Joe Biden, according to the polls, Joe Biden beats President Trump by uh, double digits, by 10, 11, uh, 12 points nationally. Uh, and, and Biden has an edge in places like, like key states like Michigan, Pennsylvania and, and Wisconsin, which played a, a key role in Trump's victory in, in 2016. Uh, and according to the polls, Biden is leading by an average of eight points in those key states. Uh, so this is all feel good news for the Democrats, but of course, then the Democrats remember that they've been here before, four years ago when polls were telling a feel good story to Clinton supporters three weeks out from elections, but she lost electoral college. 
and thus the presidency. So, um, so that's why there's a lot of anxiety uh, on, on, uh, on, on the Biden front. Uh, but, but Biden seems in better shape um, than Hillary Clinton was four years ago. Uh, polling shows Biden's position stronger on several fronts than Clinton's advantage at this point in, in, in 2016, including in the national polls. Uh, so Biden today has something that Hillary Clinton did not have in 2016, which is he has a lead among independents, he has a lead among seniors and also white college graduates and, and suburban voters. So that is important. But I have to undermine that, underline that it is uh, it is still a very much a very polarized country and the Trump win is still within the realm of, of possibility and Biden team knows that and that's why they're they're very anxious. Uh, Biden campaign manager Jen uh, Dillon said, um, you know, yeah, we all the polls show that we are we are leading double digits, but national polls do not really tell us tell us much about the pathway to the 270 elect electoral votes. So the Biden campaign is aware that even the best polling can be wrong. And in critical states, Biden and Trump are, are tied. So this, um, this brings me to a critical question in US elections, which is um, wh why is it that one candidate can win the popular vote, but another candidate wins the electoral vote and thus the presidency. So that's an important question to answer. In, as you all know, in 2016, uh, Clinton received uh, nearly 2.9 million more votes than Trump in the presidential election, 2.9 million votes. But she lost the presidency because Trump won the electoral college, which, uh, which came after he and narrow victories in, in less uh, populated Midwestern states, such as Michigan and, and Wisconsin. Uh, so, so there's a hybrid system. That's how the US constitution is set up, right? The electoral college uh, was a compromise uh, between those who wanted to elect the president directly through popular elections and those who wanted Congress to, to decide. So electoral college ha has 538 members. Um, and that number uh, allocated to each state is, is based on how many representatives that particular state has in the house plus its two senator senators. So to be elected president, the winner must get least, at least half plus one or 270 electoral votes. So this, um, this hybrid system means that, a, um, that a, a single vote in a small state carries more weight than the vote of someone in, in a larger state. So that's why um, presidential candidates, uh, they have to focus on the states that candidate must win to gather those 270 elect, uh, electoral votes. So what are the key battleground states that are important for this year's candidates to win, to win the presidency? Uh, there are, there are a couple, uh, Arizona, uh, Florida, uh, you have uh, Georgia, um, Michigan, uh, Minnesota, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and, and uh, I'm missing one, uh, and Wisconsin. Um, so good news for the Biden team, because Biden has a lead in all but one of them. Um, so they have, there are specific strategies for both camps. Trump has to max out his performance with rural voters. Uh, and he has to stop the erosion that's been going on 
in uh, erosion in support in the suburbs. And he has to, Trump has to make sure uh, that white uh, working class uh, voters who didn't vote in 2016 turn out. So that has to be Trump's um, strategy. Uh, Biden, on the other hand, uh, needs a, a huge turnout in the big cities, particularly among African American voters. And also, he, he has to do more to increase his share among Latino voters. Uh, and of course, he has to recapture some of the places that flipped to Trump in, in 2016. Um, the question is, uh, how successful has each candidate been at meeting these goals? Uh, and uh, honestly, I can't tell. Maybe, I mean, one thing is certain, Trump has failed to stop the erosion in, in the suburbs, particularly among women. But other than that, everything is up in the air. And we are a, a few days out from, uh, 12 days, I believe, out from, from election day. And I still cannot say comfortably uh, that, that Biden is going to win, despite all the polls showing he has a double digit lead. And I think neither the Biden team is, 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 is certain or, or comfortable. But uh, I can say one thing with certainty, and that is, the process after November 3rd is going to be messy. I mean, really messy. Imagine, imagine this election night scenario, right? With a great number of mail ballots yet to be counted. And Trump enjoys a narrow lead over Biden. But before all the votes can be counted, uh, and, and remember, this is a process that can, that can take days and weeks. So before all the votes can be counted, Trump declares victory. I mean, mail ballots, they, they take longer to count um, than in in-person ballots. So we could very much have a situation where the initial results uh, make it seems like Trump votes are way up. Because remember, uh, the uh, he has been encouraging his supporters to vote in person. So when you start counting those votes, it, there could be a scenario where the initial results look like he's winning. Trump is Trump votes are, are way up uh, because the, the mail ballots that are largely cast by Democrats haven't been counted yet. But once they start counting mail ballots, Biden may, may take the lead which is a completely normal situation. But Trump is going to claim that it's evidence of rigged election. So in such a scenario, uh, probably courts will get involved. Uh, and I think that is, that is one of the reasons why um, uh, Trump and Republicans have been rushing the nomination of Judge Amy Barrett in the middle of elections. I mean, in the middle of elections, millions of people are voting right now, and the confirmation is happening while voting is, is underway. So um, I know, Özgür, you wanted a prediction, <laughs> but uh, I think at, at this point, it's, it's really difficult uh, because, I mean, we've seen what happened in 2016. Hillary Clinton was at this, uh, at this point, um, at this time uh, in elections four years ago, uh, many polls predicted that she was gonna win. She was leading Trump uh, at double digits. So the exact same situation uh, and yet she lost. So I think the Democrats are, are quite anxious, although many of them, uh, some of them are more hopeful saying that they have learned a lot from the mistakes that have been made in 2016. Polling companies have learned a lot. Uh, remember, one of the problems with 2016 polling was the fact that they really disregarded um, uh, the, the education level. Uh, the, the, the Democrats are more likely to answer phones, to fill out surveys, and that wasn't really factored into, into their calculations. So, uh, so the argument is that now the polling companies have learned the lesson, so that's why uh, they might be doing a better job uh, in terms of, of sampling. 
Um, and also uh, the Biden team is saying that they have learned their lesson too. So they don't, unlike the, the Clinton uh, campaign, Clinton team that relied exclusively on these polls, the Biden team is saying that, no, we've learned our lesson. We understand that these polls have significant shortcomings and we're not gonna rely on them, we're not going to get comfortable, and in fact, no Democrat is is, is comfortable. Uh, so uh, I'll I'll um, end my remarks with that uh, happy, positive note. <laughs> I. Özgür, we can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Gunnar. It was a great overview, I said, you know, uh, you mentioned all the uncertainties surrounding the election and the situation so far. Um, should we then go ahead with the Q&A from the floor? Sure. Questions from the floor. Okay. Great. Um, Gizem Dal. Gunnar, uh, first of all, thank you for being here. I have two questions. The first one is the um, what are the main issues debated in the uh, election, and the second one, especially yeah, in the in the presidential election. So, thank you. Uh, well, if you look at public opinion polls, I think the issues are quite clear. Uh, Gizan, the country is uh, is in the midst of a recession, right? I mean. So that's reflected in the polls. Nearly 80% of registered voters say that the economy will be, will be very important to them in making their decision about who to vote for uh, in the elections. So economy, I would say, is the top issue. Um, and uh, the, the next issue, the, the next top issue is, I would say, healthcare. Again, close to 70% of voters say that healthcare is very important to their vote. And another 64% say the Supreme Court appointments are, uh, is, is, is a critical issue when they cast their, uh, their ballot. And obviously there is the question of, of the coronavirus outbreak. It's the, the, the US is still, uh, I think every other country in the world still uh, continue to grapple with the, with the pandemic. So 62% of uh, registered voters in, in the US say that the outbreak will, will be a very important factor in their decision about who to support uh, in, in November. Um, but of course, um, there are differences in how, uh, how registered voters who support Donald Trump and uh, voters who support Joe Biden view uh, the importance of these issues. For Trump supporters, for instance, the economy uh, and, and I would say violent crime are, are the most uh, important salient issues. Uh, they also, Trump supporters also cite immigration, uh, uh, gun, gun policy and, and foreign policy as, as very important to their vote. Uh, but if you look at, at Biden supporters, uh, they view healthcare and the coronavirus outbreak as the most important issues. Um, and, uh, and a sizable majority also rates racial and ethnic inequality as, as important to their vote. Ujam, for those of us who don't know the American system very well, you use the term registered voter, but it doesn't ring a bell in Turkey um, because everybody is registered by the government in Turkey, right? But in the United States, this is an issue, right? Yeah, that's it's right. It's a political issue. It's a political issue, Özgür, and it's, it's, it's actually, it's become uh, the topic of, of a larger debate. Yeah, you have to register in this country to be able to vote. Um, and if you look at, uh, if you look at the turnout, uh, it's a sad state, really, because 60% or so vote. Uh, so uh, six in 10 registered voters vote in elections. And that's a, uh, um, that's, that's a worrying number. Uh, so that's why I've seen, I've seen a commentary on this, some prominent names urging uh, a, 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 a 
compulsory uh, voting because they are making the argument that when you have a such low turnout this is not really the process is not really democratic so you really have to make it compulsory i think it's 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 the the other extreme but the fact that this there is a debate on this is i think is is very telling so uh, yes low turnout has always been a problem in in, in this country today i saw it on twitter um it is so different than turkey or europe i think it was shaquille o'neal one of the most famous athletes in america he tweeted that he voted today for the first time in his life yeah. and he's like 50 years old 50 plus and he said it feels good and i was like wow it's such a different political culture it is and i have to i have to note this i think i i'm sure you've all seen um, how hollywood uh, uh, actors and actresses they have they have mobilized uh, in an effort to to uh, to encourage people to go out and vote, so some of them are are taking off their clothes just to just to make just to increase awareness. And I've seen here on university campuses that that young people, and that's been a problem too. I mean, th this is not something that we see in countries like Turkey, in political countries like Turkey, where you have like eighty percent, eighty five percent voter turnout, which is excellent. But I mean, in this country, it's so low, and particularly the young people. They they don't have a tendency to vote. The last time something excited them was was President Obama. Uh, they uh, they went to uh, they they went out to to vote uh, in large numbers because that was that was an that was an exciting year for 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 many of those uh, young people. So this year they are they have formed several platforms. Young people, university students, they have launched several platforms in an effort to increase voter turnout among young people. So you see this great mobilization and the Republicans, I must say, Republicans are also registering voters in incredible numbers. So I think at the end of the day, uh, I mean, I, I know I talked about the issues that they have to, the, the candidates have to address, uh, the strategies that they have to adopt to win. But at the end of the day, this election is about who is going to bring out voters, who is going to mobilize its base. So I think I someone asked me a question uh, on this. Someone said, so why is Trump still so crazy? I mean, he he has he doesn't back down on his crazy messages he is as radical as he was in 2016 how come he did not adjust his strategy and my answer to that is because his entire strategy rests on if i can if i can bring out if i can mobilize those people who voted for me in 2016 i mean i'm gonna be fine uh, and the same is true for for the democrats so this is a matter the elections are about who is going to attract more voters to, to come out and vote. Uh, so mobilization is key. And we have seen on both fronts, both on the Biden front and, and, on, and on the Republican front, uh, this extraordinary effort to make sure uh, that, that people go out and vote. Great. Um, other questions? I could ask. Oh, sorry, oh, excuse me. I was wondering. So we were talking like about the polarization earlier and how it is really about the turnout. So at this point, how much are the campaigns putting into convincing these sort of like undecided voters onto joining their side? People that didn't vote for them previously to vote for them this year. Is it like a waste of time at this point, right? I mean, how much importance is given to that group of people? I think the Biden campaign is paying more attention to that. I mean, because if you look at the messaging of, of the Trump campaign, he's pretty much carrying out a similar campaign as he did in 2016, right? He's using the same narrative. He's using, he's playing to his, uh, to his hardcore base. Um, and, and if you look at it, it's, uh, he has actually, if you look at Trump campaign, uh, he's, uh, I'm not sure about the numbers, but I think 90 plus percent of his supporters still think that that he is that he's delivered and if you actually look at the things that he's done 
the, the promises that he's made, he's kept them. I mean, he talked about lowering taxes. He did, and not just for the rich, but also for middle class voters. It had a huge impact on in their lives. Uh, he talked about uh, curtailing immigration, which he did. He talked about building a, a wall. Uh, that wasn't really 100% done. Uh, he built a wall, uh, but he had promised that it was going to be paid by Mexico. Mexico obviously didn't pay for it. And uh, um, but, but if you look at the, the things that his supporters care about, he delivered on many of the promises that he's made, except for a few and yet important stuff. Um, so, uh, so he is using the same strategy because he thinks that he made promises, he kept his promises, and and he's he's focusing on that. So the Biden campaign is, I think, trying to, uh, is to it, it's it's they they face a tougher challenge, right? The Biden campaign because they want to make sure that the, the the states that were captured by Trump in two thousand. Uh, 16, like Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and they, they th those were states that voted for, for Obama, by the way. Uh, and yet they flipped uh, uh, Trump in 2016. So Biden is trying to make sure that he can recapture those states. So that means a lot of uh, fine tuning. Uh, uh, he's been very careful with his messaging. I mean, one of the, one of the speeches that he has delivered in, in Pennsylvania, I believe, he said, um, Look, this guy, Trump, he's a billionaire, right? He's, he's rich. What does he know about how much you are suffering economically? But, but I am, I was born here. I was born to a working class family. I understand your concerns. So he's trying to appeal to, uh, to white working class. Uh, now the question is, has he been effective? I've heard, uh, I've heard conflicting stuff. I've heard, um, the New York Times has this excellent podcast. Uh, they talk to people in Pennsylvania. Uh, they talk to uh, people who had been lifelong uh, supporters of, of Democrats, uh, but they voted for Trump in 2016 because they thought Democrats haven't done anything for us. So they switched in 2016. So after, um, after Biden's message, uh, the New York Times talked to those people uh, to try to understand whether whether uh, Biden's message was appealing to them, and the majority of them said, "No, actually, we don't find Democrats to be in touch with the working class," and that falls on Clinton's. Uh, that I think that Clinton, Larry Clinton, made such a big mistake. Maybe you will all remember when he when she made fun of. Uh, those white working class people who voted for, who supported Trump, he said they are deplorables. Half of them are deplorable. So, and, and also Hillary Clinton's image as this elite who is clueless about the lives and the struggles of, of the working class. Uh, I think that was a breaking point in the sense that people started seeing uh, the, uh, the Democrats as a party that was out, out of touch with the reality of everyday people. And that's when you saw these people switching to President Trump. Uh, and can, obviously, Joe Biden is a completely different profile than Hillary Clinton. He has much more appeal to the white class, uh, the, the, the white working class. Uh, and he's been using that in his in his narrative, um, but the New York Times, when they talked to these people, many of them said, you know, uh, yeah, Biden is okay, but we really don't think the the, the, the Democrats are going to do much for us. And they say uh, Trump has still delivered, although several uh, plans have been closed down in their states, and many of them lost their jobs. They still trust Trump. Uh, with the economy more than they trust Biden. So the question comes down to, can you really appeal to these people? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, the, the, the polling, some polling says Biden has done a, done a better job than Hillary Clinton in terms of uh, uh, capturing the attention and loyalty of those people. But uh, there are others who think that, that Trump has done a great job with economy. And, and here, uh, the, um, 
the narrative is that, uh, yeah, COVID happened, but it wasn't Trump's fault, right? He did everything he could. And we are seeing an economic downturn because of that, but Trump is gonna fix it. So that is, that is the narrative. Uh, but you also see a separate uh, group of voters who are undecided, who really uh, value the way the, the White House is handling the coronavirus pandemic. And you have seniors mostly among those people. When they see their candidate for Senate, a Republican candidate not wearing a mask in a super spreader event at the White House, they worry. When they see their president who had just contracted coronavirus and got out of the hospital, taking off his mask, they worry. So, so I think uh, one of the key constituencies, the target constituency is gonna be those people who are extremely worried about, uh, about uh, coronavirus. And I think if you look at that population, the majority of them trust Biden more than they trust um, Trump. Okay, um, I have many questions here, so let me just get maybe three of them. Uh, I'll just get them in bunches. Uh, okay, if it's fine with you, Gunnar. Um, Ushul, um, Denis, and Sarai, can you ask your questions quickly? Um, hi, Gunnar Rajam, and thank you for your remarks on the presidential elections and the congressional elections. My question is regarding your expertise. Do you think Middle East as a region is an issue for the presidential or congressional elections? Uh, well, um, thank you. So, so, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we're, we're going to bundle a few. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, bundle, yes. <laughs> Denis? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Is my voice okay? Okay, uh, thank you for being us here tonight, first of all. Uh, I wanted to turn to the more foreign policy related issues and wanted to ask if um, the presidential election, if uh, the foreign policies uh, are a big and important part of the presidential election uh, about to take place. And if so, uh, I wanted to ask further that what are the uh, most important hot topics related to foreign policy in during the presidential debates. Uh, Sarai, thank you. Thank you, Gunnar Rajam. Uh, I know we said it's hard to make predictions on the results, but I wonder your opinion on how can the uh, results can change Turkey and U.S. relations. For example, what happens if Trump wins, and what happens if uh, Democrats control both the House and Senate? Thank you. Three very related bundled questions. For you. Yeah, they are, they are all great questions. Thank you. So to Ushils and Denis' questions about um, how uh, prominent foreign policy has been in this campaign. Uh, well, according to this polling, I believe it was from ABC, uh, the 50 per, 57% say foreign policy is an important issue. But frankly, it has been missing from the 2020 campaign. I mean, even issues such as Russia and China have been, uh, have been framed largely around their domestic implications, such as interference in election security and the local effect of President Donald Trump's trade wars. So, um, and I think this is part of a general decline. There has been a decline in public interest in global events. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we talk about this, this often, how um, every day we watch uh, uh, news hour, uh, PBS news hour, uh, and it's incredible how little attention has been paid to, to foreign, uh, foreign policy compared to, to, to previous years. So this is, I think, general trend. There has been a decline in interest, uh, in public interest in global events for decades, but it's more so uh, now given all the domestic problems that demand attention uh, from, from the effects of COVID uh, to economic problems and societal unrest and racial injustice. So there's just a, a long laundry list of problems uh, that, that the, the, the US is facing at the moment uh, is uh, you really, you, you don't hear much about foreign policy and ultimately 
uh, I'm going to say this again, this election is, is dominated by Donald Trump's character. Um, and obviously you have its salient issues with the pandemic and the economic problems, foreign policy is simply not a priority for, uh, for voters. Uh, and there was Sarai's question about uh, Turkey, Turkey, US relations. And um, uh, well, you know, Turkey, US relations have been rocky to say the least for the last five years or so. Uh, and as you all know, problems started under, under the Obama administration, the, the US decision to, to cooperate with the YPG, extradition of Gulen, and then the general lack of, of trust uh, basically poisoned the partnership, which was off to a good start. Remember Obama delivering its speech at the Turkish parliament. Uh, so the relations were off to a good start, but it became very troubling uh, uh, shortly afterwards. So by the time the US elections were held in November 2016, uh, Turkey-US relations had been rocked by, by serious disagreements. So if you look at it from Erdogan's perspective, the Obama administration uh, ended up being a huge disappointment. So Donald Trump's election was therefore welcome news in Ankara. And, and, and I think Erdogan hoped to turn a new page in relations with the US and had the, 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 the faith in, in his friend in the White House, President Trump. So four years on, uh, this is gonna be a long answer to your question, but I think it's important to understand the background to be able to project into the future. So four years on, uh, Trump has proven himself worthy of Erdogan's trust, right? At a time when uh, Obama uh, era problems uh, continue to hound Turkey-US relations, uh, which has caused unprecedented frustration, by the way, in the Congress, at the Pentagon and the State Department, Trump still considers Erdogan a very good friend. And he's done everything. I mean, he's, he's gone the extra mile to shield him, to shield Erdogan from congressional sanctions. Uh, Turkey purchased S-400 uh, missile defense. Uh, I mean, it, it, there were just like so many problems uh, and the Congress was frustrated uh, and Trump did his best. But despite his best intentions, he couldn't fix the most critical problems. Uh, Gulen remains in, in, in Pennsylvania, Halkbank has been indicted, Congress is more determined than ever to punish Erdogan over the S-400s. Uh, the Syria question remains there, there are yeah, a few hundred US troops there in Syria, uh, but they still consider the YPG a key ally. So, uh, so, so there are really important problems. So now the question is, can Biden come? Uh, and many are promoting a reset in Turkey-US ties, right? Uh, can he do that? Or is, will he be willing to do that? Um, and, and I think the answer is, is somewhere between a yes and, and a no. I mean, should Biden win? I think uh, th this prospect is terrifying. It must be terrifying for people in Ankara. It must be terrifying for, for Erdogan and his circle because he won't be able to just pick up the phone and reach the US president directly to ask for favors if Biden is elected. Nor will the White House be as enthusiastic about shielding Turkey from the sanctions, right? Because the Congress is infuriated and it's intent on, on imposing those sanctions. Uh, so, and, and Biden has been very clear about what he thinks about Erdogan, right? He, uh, uh, Trump uh, praised Erdogan as a tough guy uh, and Biden described him as an autocrat. Uh, and, and Biden often uh, talks about how he's committed to putting strengthening democracy back on the agenda. He talks about, for instance, convening a summit of the world's democracies in his first year. So that suggests he might be vocal about criticizing Erdogan uh, more. Uh, the, you, you'll, you'll remember in 2016 when he was the vice president then, he was on a two-day visit to Turkey and he angered the Turkish government uh, when he criticized the lack of freedom of expression in the country. And then he met with John Dundar's wife and son. Uh, so uh, 
so he's going to be a more problematic president uh, in, in terms of Turkey's ties. And of course, another worry in Ankara is what is Biden going to do in Syria? What we've seen so far is he's, he's been a very pro-Kurdish uh, uh, leader, uh, both in Syria and Iraq. He famously proposed the division of Iraq along ethnic lines and sectarian lines in 2016. Uh, uh, and more recently, he criticized, uh, Biden criticized Trump's decision to pull out troops from Syria and abandon the Kurds. Uh, and his close allies, uh, his close um, aides have signaled that the US would keep troops in Syria to help the Kurdish forces. So that is going to be problematic. Um, and also, I think another worry for, for Turkey is, is uh, a Biden presidency might be tougher uh, towards uh, Ankara in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, there has been, uh, the United States has been cultivating closer ties to Greece under this administration. Uh, and the Congress lifted the sanctions uh, imposed on on Cyprus, for instance. So Pompeo has often criticized Turkey's aggressive stance in Eastern Mediterranean. But if Biden becomes the president, the fear is that he's going to be even more tougher. So that is uh, a, a problem. And I think uh, at the end of the day, Biden is going to be potentially more a uh, tougher on, on Russia and China, which will, will be problematic for Turkey. So. Um, so these are all all the uh, the potential uh, problems, but I think at the end of the day, it, it won't mean that a Biden presidency is going to burn bridges with Erdogan because he's a guy. Biden is a guy who really values personal relationships, and he also values um, uh, institutions. So he's going to be a completely different president than President Trump. But when it comes to foreign policy issues. As you guys, uh, students of IR, know probably better than I do, that it, it, it structure matters. Uh, so you don't operate in a vacuum. Uh, so he is going to be taking over a complicated Turkey file, uh, and he has Biden is going to have other priorities. So he'll have to he'll have to balance things, which suggests to me uh, that. It, he'll he'll uh, he'll be somewhere in between. He's not going to throw away his partnership with Turkey. We'll try to work with Turkey, especially when it comes to uh, counterbalancing Russia, and uh, and uh, we'll work closely uh, in the fight against ISIS. Uh, but there will be more problematic areas as well. I I, I keep forgetting this. Sorry, um, we have four questions left. Let's take them very quickly because I know you have to go somewhere else and we have 10 minutes left. So um, Madeline, Volkan, Ali and Khan, if you could ask your questions quickly in that order. Madeline. Hi, thank you again for talking to us. Um, I just wanted to hear your perspective on how voter suppression might be an issue across the congressional elections um, and if it will be raised as a problem after the results come in or not. So, oh, I, so I, okay. Uh, I'm, I have a question about, for, first of all, thank you, Hojo. I have a question on uh, Biden's candidacy. Do you think that Democrats could produce a better candidate than Biden, because I remember that he was not a well-respected and strong vice president during Obama presidency. And, you know, he, he is, I think, 78 years old. And, you know, I, he, I know he won primaries, so he came through a democratic process, but I don't know, if, is there a possible better candidate to go against Trump? Ali? Uh, yeah, it is my turn. Uh, my question is uh, very related to what Volkan asked. So here it is. Uh, since the problems that brought uh, that brought Trump to power are still not uh, totally solved, uh, why Trump doesn't have a rival that is as uh, populist as uh, Trump himself? Khan? Uh, 
thank you, Professor Tol, for your talk. I wanted to ask about demographics. Um, do the Republicans over the long term fear uh, a loss of power, a prolonged loss of power due to shifting demographics? Thank you. Great questions. Uh, so on the voter suppression issue, it is an issue. There is a, I mean, maybe you've seen there are long queues. Uh, people waited for 11 hours to vote. Um, there are restrictive uh, voting laws uh, in place, and some of them have been taken to courts. Uh, there are limited access to, to polling stations. Um, and then we have something else, which is the mail-in voting. That's going to be um that's going to be a real problem because uh, you can you can track uh, your uh, your your vote but it's still many of the the states they don't have uh, the the infrastructure to handle that that's why in my remarks i said it was going to be really messy so those are some of the obstacles uh, that that we already had in place but those obstacles have been amplified um with the pandemic uh, which uh, has led to a nationwide um, shortage of poll workers. Uh, so that is a huge problem. And fewer in-person polling stations, right? People are having to, uh, people, people have to do so many things uh, to, to, to be able to cast their votes. So uh, it is, some of them have been uh, addressed uh, but that is something that really that that worries me, and I know it worries many people, particularly Democrats, because if if the, the higher turnout is uh, is projected to to benefit uh, Democrats uh, than it does uh, Trump, so that's why that's, that's a worry that the Democrats have. And the second question about whether there's a better there was a better candidate than Biden. I mean, my personal view is yes. Uh, I think Bernie was a much better candidate than 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 Biden. But of course, uh, and I ask that question to myself very often, especially when I see Biden stumbling. When I see him, um, you know, he, he's old and 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 tired. I think he is a very decent human being, uh, but. Uh, but yeah, that's a problem. I mean, he's he's gonna be old, and that's why picking the right vice president was so important for Biden. And I think he picked the right vice president. Um, but I, I think overall the question is: uh, Would someone like Bernie Sanders, for instance, would he would he do the job? I mean, I think the worry among many Democrats who were trying to pick from uh, from a, a, a list of great names was the question that dominated was, can he or she beat Trump? So uh, even, even diehard Bernie supporters, uh, some of them said, yeah, we love this guy. He has all the right answers for the problems of the country. And yet, uh, you know, if he runs against Trump, uh, you're going to give a huge uh, weapon uh, to be used by Trump against, against uh, someone uh, like Bernie. He's going to say, he's already saying that for Biden, by the way. Biden could not have been further away from being a socialist. He's, he's such a... Uh, He's uh, such a mainstream mainstream guy, and yet still he's trying to frame Trump. Trump is trying to frame him as a as a socialist. He's saying that the the, the the party has been taken over by by the socialists. So I think overall, um, Biden is the right person for the right time because this country has suffered. Uh, I remember I said what's on the ballot is uh, the, the key issue is President Trump's personality, his character. Uh, so many lies, uh, so many scandals. Um, I think at this point, uh, the, the, the people need normalcy. They need a normal president who doesn't obsessively tweet, say outrageous things, uh, constantly lie. So if you look at that, I think Biden's personality is, is the answer at this point in time. So that's why uh, I think he is the guy who has uh, the ability to, to capture 
the votes of undecided people who has the ability to capture those voters who maybe supported Trump in 2016, but who are tired of the craziness. Uh, so in that regard, I think, uh, I think Biden uh, was, was the right choice. Uh, and what was the third question? There was a... There was one about demographics, I think. Oh yeah, demographics, that's a very important question. So I think the demographics is, uh, is in favor is going to strengthen uh, the, the, the Democrats in the long run, because we are talking about a country in which um, uh, the, 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 the number of non-white uh, people is, is, in, is increasing. You have more Latino uh, voters, you have more Asians. So it's going to be a more diverse society with younger votes. So the demographics is actually in favor of, of Democrats. I think that's it, Hojam. You answered all of them. Thank you very much for being here. I think this was a wonderful talk. I'm informed. I'm sure all of our students do. And hope to see you again in our department, maybe after the coronavirus, maybe in person. person. Yeah, I've never, I've never been to your campus, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And again, uh, thank you again, Özgür. This has been such a pleasure and uh, thanks to all of you guys for attending and asking great questions. I'm looking forward to talking to you again. Thank you, Hajam. Good thanks. luck and, and stay safe. Hope to see you soon. You too. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.